nothing that I'm aware of as a physician whose passion is to help people become the best biological versions of themselves possible to optimize their health. And nothing is more valuable to eliminate than visceral fat. Nothing. The term I like to call visceral fat is invisible obesity. So it's the notion that you're obese, but you're invisibly so. You cannot see it. It is like entangled. It's adherent. It resists. It just is like cancer. It's so stuck in there. It's too dangerous to try to remedy. But easy peasy for the body to get rid of it once you start living a healthy lifestyle. So that's what I specialize in, how you get rid of visceral fat. Dr. Sean, I want to jump right in. Let's talk about what visceral fat is and why it's important. Yeah. So um, visceral fat is a really interesting biomarker that I found out about. I'll give you a, a basic history of just my own uh, introduction occurred um, to visceral fat back in 2013. So um, I have been formally trained as an emergency medicine physician. I, uh, after four years of medical school, I went and specialized in a residency program for four additional years, learning how to deal with emergencies. And then I completely changed over a period of time from dealing with emergencies and having absolutely no interest whatsoever in health and preventive preventive medicine and how to how to live a more healthy life to becoming honestly obsessed with it and what happened was interposed between that was visceral fat and i had no training on visceral fat in medical school it's not something that's taught in any medical school it might be mentioned but it it gets more attention on social media uh, or other places in the research area than it does in medical school. And there's probably a lot of reasons for that, but just it's interesting that it's completely eliminated from the curriculum in medical schools, which I only recently found out about is standardized. Medical schools are all, if they're, if they're certified uh, medical schools, like in the United States, rep, all medical schools are uh, in the United States are reputable. Uh, their curriculum is standardized. But right away, first comment about visceral fat, it's not taught in medical school. It's something that I learned afterwards when I met with a, and met a physician who was studying uh, heart disease, who was a researcher at the UW, University of Washington up in Seattle. And he was studying heart disease. And he found out accidentally about visceral fat. It was very interesting. So he was scanning people, uh, looking at uh, examples of, of chronic disease using MRIs, looking particularly at a particular form of chronic disease, um, uh, back pain, chronic back pain. And he noticed the people that had the worst backs had the most amount of white stuff in their abdomen. And he's like, what is this white stuff? And uh, so he found out about visceral fat and uh, he shared it with me. Uh, invited me to get scanned. He, he at the time was so into it that he bought an MRI scanner as a researcher. He bought it. And, um, and so he was doing all these scans and he scanned me and I was terrified, uh, you know, about this visceral fat, he, what he told me about it. I was like, God, I hope I don't have it. It sounds horrible. And uh, I did a little research and I knew it was some bad stuff. So by way of, uh, you know, explain it to your audience, people they're following, um, you know, this is a an MRI image that's unaltered, and we take this MRI image uh, through. I'll just use my my body as an example. Uh, a slice through the abdomen, sort of like if you imagine doing a pizza slice through my abdomen here. Uh, you create this kind of an image that almost looks like a pizza, and the dark structures on the side are muscles. So, just so your audience knows where this is, this basically in the area around the belly button of, of the abdomen. And the dark structures are the muscles. So these two dark structures are your six pack. So those are your dominus rectus, your abdominal muscles. These muscles in the, uh, on the bottom here are your back muscles. They're turned erecte spinae. So the erecte spinae muscles. It's kind of a cool name because that keeps your back erect. 
Who doesn't have an erect back? Old people. It's not because they're old. It's because this stuff was never detected and nobody did anything about it. And it gets all inflamed and becomes sarcopenic. So the white stuff in the middle here is visceral fat. So when you have an MRI of your body or CT, uh, I'm sorry, MRI of your abdomen or CT of your abdomen, you want to have uh, an assessment of your visceral fat. Uh, MRI shows fat as white. In a CT, it shows up as black. But they're, they're always going to be the same amount. It doesn't change. The CT and MRI are pretty comparable modalities for visualizing uh, visceral fat. So in the image above, it's the same image. We just paint the visceral fat red so the audience can understand what we're talking about. And we paint the subcutaneous fat, which is on the outside, yellow. So that yellow uh, it, it brings some caution. Um, it's, it's the type of fat that most people are aware of. Uh, they, they grab their fat on their body, and that's how they assess their fat. I mean, they don't even give much thought to fat deep in your body, but that's where most of it is. It's going to be deep in your abdomen. So the term I like to call visceral fat is invisible obesity. So it's the notion that you're obese, but you're invisibly so. You cannot see it. It's this type of fat that's deep in your abdomen. So why is it different and why is it bad? What makes it worse than subcutaneous fat, the stuff on the outside? Well, it's because the nature of visceral fat is it's secretory. It secretes inflammatory substances, particularly like IL-6, interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha, adipokines, cytokines, chemokines, these chemical, uh, biochemical substances that get released by these particular types of fat cells that are highly inflammatory over a period of time. So a very interesting point that has to be made with regard to visceral fat is I could take you, Jesse, put a bunch of visceral fat inside your abdomen and there wouldn't be immediate change. It would happen over a period of time as you're exposed to that. Sort of like radiation or a good example is arsenic. Arsenic uh, kills can kill over a slow period of time you get exposed to it. But a small exposure doesn't do much harm. Visceral fat is the same way. So the two deciding factors with regard to how much it hurts your health are how much you have, and how long you've been exposed to it. So if you are pretty healthy your whole life, and then you, uh, and we'll get into what causes visceral fat, and then suddenly at the age of 50 or 30 or 70, you accumulate a huge amount of visceral fat, no big deal for a short period of time. <clears throat> but the longer you hold on to it, the worse off you are. And that's why you see these people that gain a lot of weight and lose weight and they, they're like do fitness channels and they show that there's not a whole, they recover pretty nice. That's because they get rid of that visceral fat in a short period of time. But there are consequences over the longer you have that and they can be very severe. So the other interesting point to make about visceral fat is it is the first expression of disease that we found inside the body that basically says where humanity goes wrong. And we saw it in children that we scanned as young as four. And so at, and the, the more those kids ate like processed foods, waffles, pancakes, sugary cereals in the morning, syrup and things like that, the more visceral fat they would accumulate. And so it's the same thing with adults. The more processed foods you eat, the more visceral fat you're going to get deposited within you. And the last point I'll make as far as an introduction about visceral fat is to whet your audience's appetite. Nothing that I'm aware of as a physician whose passion is to help people become the best biological versions of themselves possible to optimize their health. And nothing is more valuable to eliminate than visceral fat.
nothing, nothing else, following nothing else, everything else is less effective to improve a human being than following visceral fat and getting rid of it. So it's a really important area, and it starts with where it is, understanding it, why its, why its nature is so bad. Are you ever left wondering whether these dietary and lifestyle changes you're making are actually having an impact on your health? This is where Inside Tracker comes in. You get a personalized picture of what's happening inside your body and a custom action plan to help you reach your health goals. There's five steps to the process. First one being choosing your health plan. Second, you get your blood work done and they make this really easy. They can come right out to the house. Step three is to get your analysis. Step four is to implement your custom action plan. And then step five is to retest and recalibrate. And that last step you can do periodically over time to continue to monitor what's happening inside your body and continue to tweak your diet and lifestyle. As a viewer of the show, you get 20% off Inside Tracker by following the link in the description and using the code JESSE20 at checkout. Sign up for Inside Tracker today to get a personalized picture of what's happening inside your body and a custom action plan to help you reach your health goals. All right, there's a lot we can get into there. That was a great overview. You talked about the chemical aspect, the fact that it's causing these inflammatory molecules to circulate the body and cause different problems. I'm curious about the actual structure, the physical structure of this fat. Looking at the picture there, it looks like it's strangling all the organs in the abdominal cavity. So is there a physical challenge with this as well, or is it all chemical? Yeah, well, that's, uh, that is interesting. Um, that's a very insightful question. So there is a physical component uh, to this, um, and strangling is a pretty good word. Um, recently, I was researching liposuction. Liposuction is a surgical procedure where you remove fat from the abdomen, and that procedure just eliminates this fat here, you know, on the outside, subcutaneous fat, and it doesn't, and it doesn't remove this because it's super hard to mechanically, physically remove this. A surgeon has to work extremely hard to get rid of it. It is like entangled, it's adherent, it resists, it just is like, like cancer. It just, it's so stuck in there that you just, they, it's too dangerous to try to remedy. But easy peasy for the body to get rid of it once you start living a healthy lifestyle. So that's what I specialize in, how you get rid of visceral fat. But the physical properties really uh, are not that contributory, except it's hard, you, you can't surgically remove it. And a lot of people think, if I've got a belly that's sticking out, I've got a lot of visceral fat. It has less, of, less to do with the, the mechanical properties of, let's say, accumulating visceral fat sticking out your, your body. Uh, and it has more to do with the biochemical properties, you know, those inflammatory substances that travel through your body and make your muscles work less good. So the, we'll, we'll get into an image of this with the dad bod, but the dad bod is is less the problem with accumulated visceral fat and more the problem of the exposure of those chemicals and those cytokines and those inflammatory molecules weakening the abdomen to the point that that man or woman who may have a, a I don't know what the equivalent of a dad bod is, a, a, a mama bod. You know, uh, uh, a lot of women think their belly sticks out because they've had a lot of babies. <laughs> it really has more to do with visceral fat weakening their, their abdominal muscles. I, I can show you lots of women that are multiparous that have had lots of babies, completely flat abdomens. And the reason? They never had visceral fat. They didn't didn't accumulate it, and we and hopefully we'll get and get a, a picture of that. But let me show you a a, a nice picture of, you know, uh, two contrasting abdomens, okay? So it's helpful for people who have no awareness of visceral fat, well, to, to, to be able to look at an MRI scan, say they get one, and how, how, you know, what does a good MRI scan look like and a bad MRI scan in terms of visceral fat? And the reason why I do this with my clients is because, unfortunately, I'm not kidding. It's not taught in medical school so radiologists don't know about this and don't read it. 
you will have an abdominal CT and you can pull it guarantee pull any report. If you ever could find one, I'd love to hear from anybody, but nobody ever has. Find a single report of your abdominal CT or MRI and you'll see it never even comments on visceral fat, even though it's the biggest thing inside that abdomen. It's never read. And it's also the most important thing that should be read. It's completely ignored. So this is a really healthy abdomen. It's oval shaped, so it doesn't look like a dad bod. The dark structures on the sides, the muscles are prodigious. They're massive, they're large, they're healthy. And they're also devoid of white, no white is in there. So those muscles are very lean. They're not uh, afflicted with infiltrating inflammatory fat, what I call human marbling. Now these muscles down here are small, these oblique muscles, and you can see those white streaks, maybe if I, I blow it up a little bit more and uh, pull it up, you can, you can see these white streaks in those dark structures. That is marbleization of this guy's muscle, and he's turned it into basically like a ribeye steak. It's inflammatory. And we kind of laugh about it. We even think marbleized steak is good. It's not. That's a diseased cow. And when we see it in humans, it's a diseased human being. And it's always accompanied by all this white inside, the visceral fat. And it's completely ignored now by radiologists and even orthopedic surgeons. My best friend in the world is an orthopedic surgeon, and he has, throughout his whole career, ignored marbleization in fat because it just wasn't part of his training. And now I've gotten convinced of how bad this visceral fat is, and now he's tracking that it always causes this. So the other defining feature is it shrinks these muscles. See how small this guy's muscles are? And look how big this guy's muscles are. So when you get a lot of visceral fat, it starts shrinking your muscles. So a big problem in America today is sarcopenia. That's a big word. Uh, it, 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 the ter we, we also call it in, in medical lingo, medical frailty. The other way, the other layman's term for this is your muscles shrink. And your muscles not only shrink in their mass in terms of their, how much muscle tissue you have, but in their performance. So even if you have the same amount of muscle, your muscles are also not performing as well. So why is this a problem? Because nobody's addressing it. And it's, it's what, what the bottom line of sarcopenia is, you can't do this. When you get to be a certain age, you, you, you're like this. You know, struggling to get out of a chair. And eventually you need help. And eventually you're stuck in a wheelchair or a hospital bed, and you, you just can't get out. You're stuck in there. So sarcopenia is a form of chronic disease that is from ignored visceral fat, and ignored, the technical term for this fat in the muscle, is myosteatosis. So I like to give an example of what looks good, example of what looks bad, to educate people, and then to really hit this home, Jesse, so people understand this relationship between visceral fat and other forms of disease in the body. This is, again, mostly white in this particular scan here. You can see there's a lot of visceral fat in there. And then look at the person's legs that we've, we scanned at the same time. And I'm just going to try to focus in on those legs. And what you can see in those legs are, see all the white streaks? Yeah. So that's that inflammatory fat being laid down in this muscle tissue. Now, right now, I know what's going on in your, your mind. Jesse's wondering, I wonder if I got that. That doesn't look good. You've never been to medical school and you just looked at that and you're wondering, do I have that fat in my muscle? And you don't want it. What you really want to have is this guy's legs. Look at these beautiful legs. Not a streak of fat in them. It's filet mignon. This is beautiful muscle because these legs belong to this abdomen. And this abdomen, look at the muscles in that abdomen. That there is the finest abdomen this MD researcher has ever laid eyes on. The healthiest human being I've ever seen. He's an Olympic sprinter, fantastically healthy. And so when we started to research 
the reversal of chronic disease informed our objective to approach the not National Science Foundation for funding on a study on the developing the best strategies and identifying the best targets to reverse chronic disease. We honed in on this, this biomarker of visceral fat and a particular strategy using uh, sprinting. So look at the beautiful muscles this guy has. So the bottom line is, if you're listening today and you're at all interested in being the, you know, the ultimately healthy person, then you want to have a, the smallest amount of visceral fat or no visceral fat possible. And you want to have the healthiest muscles possible that are devoid of this fatty, this fatty infiltration. And you want to get yourself educated in this. So spend a little time here at the beginning to explain, you know, the good and bad, the relationship between uh, visceral fat and the muscles. And the other comment I would have is, extraordinarily different as these two exams are. Like, first of all, this guy here, the radiologist should should uh, look at their cell phone, call them up and say, hey, uh, I never talk to people that I scan, but I want to talk to you because I want you to tell me, what do you do? How do you live? What do you eat? How do you exercise? Because I want to be like you. And this guy, he should call up and say, my God, uh, you're on the verge of, potentially having a heart attack or developing cancer because you have such dangerous elevated levels of visceral fat. And I just want to warn you, I want you to immediately go to your doctor and start working on getting rid of your visceral fat. But none of those conversations happened. Instead, both of these scans were read as normal. And they couldn't be further from normal. And that's what I do. I specialize in trying to look at these important biomarkers, educating people, and trying to break through the morass of conventional healthcare, which just chases disease that we can make money from. There's no current treatment programs for visceral fat. It's all lifestyle. There's no medications. There's no surgical procedures. And that's why it's ignored. All right. This is a great overview. A lot we can get into from here. I want to start by talking more about this muscle piece. So you mentioned the fact that visceral fat, what's associated with it is that fat going into the muscles and shrinking them also. So you're going to have the marbling, the shrinking, and they're going to perform less than optimal at that point. Is it fair to say that the visceral fat comes first and then as time goes on, it goes into the muscle or do they both kind of happen around the same time? Boy, really good question. I do a lot of shows on visceral fat, and that's the first time I've ever gotten that. So um, it is uh, the case that uh, visceral fat happens first. So in those young kids, we see their muscles are free of that uh, myosteatosis, that human marbling, initially. But as visceral fat accumulates, slowly with time, you get this human, this marbling, marbleization. Now, these are honestly steaks. So this is a completely different species. These would be known as cows. <laughs> and so uh, the same thing happens uh, with, with humans. So as they develop visceral fat, the marbleization uh, starts occurring in their muscles. But the, the other interesting thing is we see visceral fat get eradicated first. And then it's followed by muscles, uh, myosteatosis, that marbling will leave the muscle uh, eventually. So when when I do my follow-up scans, I want to get the best results possible. I want to, I've been doing this for a long time, 13 years, optimizing humans. So I got it down to a real art form. And so I don't want to show them a follow-up scan that doesn't have much difference. I want to knock their socks off. So when they do the strategies I tell them to do, they see that visceral fat is gone. And they see eventually when it's the right time, I scan those legs and I show them that fat is gone too. So yeah, to answer your question first, when you start living properly, nature gets rid of the most dangerous stuff, visceral fat first, it goes away faster, it's larger. And uh, it's not that this, I don't want to suggest this isn't dangerous because the truth is just recently, three months ago, AI, AI is just, it's like, it's, it's like a whole new filter that just looks at things better. And so AI went back and studied 
all, you know, looked at all these other studies that talked about muscle fat, and what they found was that what humans hadn't figured out is uh, convincingly, this doubles your risk for death from a heart attack or stroke compared to obesity. So as bad as obesity is for heart, att heart attacks and strokes, and you should, if you're listening to this podcast, know that obesity really is incompatible and inimical to a healthy life, then you really ought to be alarmed at the notion that there's something two times worse. And it's this fatty infiltrate here, and it already always corresponds to visceral fat. So yeah, it's a, it's a big problem, and you should, should be thinking about it. You're likely going to get to this next, but as you talk about the heart, where my mind goes, you're showing this picture here of the two different stakes. The heart and our blood vessels have muscle in them. We've been talking about this from a skeletal muscle or voluntary muscles to this point perspective when you show pictures of the legs and such. So when you talk about danger of a heart attack, is it because the muscle of the heart is becoming infiltrated like the skeletal muscle? Yeah, that's really, that's, uh, already I've done a lot of podcasts. You, you've asked the best questions. <laughs> I've ever had of any host. So fantastic. Oh, thank so, you. Um, yeah. Let me show you an example of that heart fat. Okay. So these two dark structures to the, uh, on the right and left are your lungs. So this is your, your, a uh, scan through your chest. Now in between your lung is where your heart resides. And I've already mentioned on an MRI scan that fat shows up as white. So, and this, this color, this is, this is all fat around, uh, the heart of, believe it or not, a 34-year-old male who happened to be a distance runner. He would run 8 to 10 uh, marathons uh, uh, a year. This is his visceral fat. So he's filled with visceral fat, but you should also see as very little subcute fat. Do you see how thin he is on the outside? So there's a lot of people that are thin outside and fat inside. We call them tophies. And distance runners are like that. And people that eat a lot of carbohydrates and maybe exercise a lot. So who, who looks, uh, who's really thin on the outside and is filled with visceral fat? Bodybuilders. They're another class of people. And so they're looking at all their muscle and they're looking at the wrong kind of fat, the fat outside. Uh, it's the perfect fat to look at, I suppose, if you're doing a bodybuilding competition and you want to show striations and you don't want to show a thin layer of fat. But that Heart fat also corresponds to that visceral fat, and that's what we, we see in here. So that's fat around the heart. You also alluded to whether fat gets deposited in the muscle tissue itself, because there's three types of muscle tissue in the human body. The first was we mentioned, and we showed examples of skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle are like muscles in your arms, your legs, your abdominal musculature. Those are muscles that you operate, that you fire, and you get to do stuff. Like when you plank, you use your abdominal muscles. When you do pull-ups, you're doing your arm muscles, your skeletal muscles. Your cardiac mus muscle is completely different. It's, it's, it's firing, but it's firing automatically. You're not volitionally thinking about it. And it has a histologically, meaning uh, how you look at it underneath a microscope, very different type of typology. So... As a med student, we had to look under a microscope and be able to identify skeletal muscle versus cardiac muscle versus the third type of muscle, which is smooth muscle. And smooth muscle is uh, still altogether different from skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle. And smooth muscle is found within your endocrine system, your gastrointestinal system, your GI tract, uh, and within your cardiovascular system, arteries veins, and capillaries. Capillaries are the unspoken darlings of our health. That's where the magic happens. That's where we exchange oxygen, nutrition, energy to feed and support ourselves. I'm an active duty lieutenant colonel in the Army National Guard. And so I have some military concepts, not a lot. 
you don't want, they don't call me to play in the wars. I'm in the back taking care of people, but I do know something about battle plans and you got to have supply lines and the better your supply lines, the better your troops are and their operations and being able to do what they want and need to do. Same thing with your sales, but almost nobody thinks about their capillaries and the state of that supply line being able to feed, provide, and support all the tissues, every cell of your body is mediated through those capillaries. And so what happens in, uh, uh, with, with regard to visceral fat and fatty infiltration is fat gets deposited in the skeletal muscle. I think fat is being deposited within the cardiac myometrium, the cardiac tissue, cardiac cells. And the third area, I think fat is also invading and infiltrating is the smooth muscle tissue of those arteries, veins, and capillaries. Now, why do I say that? Well, I just have this theory because as we eliminate visceral fat and this cardiac fat, something very interesting is, is happening, uh, and I'll just skip ahead for uh, the moment, uh, within arteries. So in this scan, we're looking at brain arteries. So dark is blood flow. And do you see how hazy it's getting, um, how hazy it gets right here and how it's devoid right there? That's a big plaque. And we can, we can move over um, to, um, let me just get this scan so you can see the side, how hazy it is on this other side too. The blood flow is, is, is not as good. And this, this process, this plaque that's happening is atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So I like to say it's clogged plumbing. You know, a major artery in the brain, this happens to be the middle cerebral artery, is the blood flow is being compromised by soft plaque that's being deposited in there. But what happens, which is exciting, is this artery is opened up here, and the other artery is opened up. That, that huge plaque is completely opened up in just nine months after eliminating visceral fat, by eliminating visceral fat, not after eliminating, by eliminating visceral fat, those arteries opened up. So blood flow improved. And so what I theorize is those, those capillaries that are distal to that artery are also opening up and probably less infiltration of that. Now I'd like to have, if there's a, a pathologist out there, histopathologist that does uh, 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 fresh frozen uh, s slices and processing histological specimens uh, of, of those capillaries and arteries, I'd love to be able to show its correlation to visceral fat. It's just that I can't see that on an MRI scan. So it's just theoretical until it's being done. But what, what I can support anecdotally, Jesse, is when those arteries open up, people's memory uh, is, is improved, their intelligence improved, their error rate is improved. And this is why we start scanning brains is after scanning 6,000 abdomens at the very end, seven years of doing this study, right at the last year, we scanned 20 brains and we saw these clogged arteries. And we, it took us forever because people kept harassing us. Why am I getting smarter? Why is my memory going improving? You know, why do I make less mistakes? And so we ultimately get, we got tired of answering, we don't know. So we started scanning brains and we saw this clogged arteries are opening, opening up. Now, the other interesting thing that happened is people who open up those arteries, their, their arterial pulse sites, instead of where you could feel it, you could see it. Their arteries became visibly pulsatile. So you get this confirmation visually mediated by your own body's ability to see that your blood flow is now improved to the point that you can see those pulses all over your body. So I have them in 18 different locations that I can see. And my clients, once I get them to get rid of visceral fat, open up their arteries, they get these visible pulses. So I like to tout that as a key biological indicator that people ought to be looking at besides visceral fat, is 
the visible appearance of pulsatile arteries that they can see in their bodies. Absolutely free. So I think it's worth pointing as a, um, for the sake of the audience that uh, there's an association or correlation with visceral fat, visceral adipose tissue with uh, myosteatosis, which is infiltration of fat in the muscle or muscle, uh, fatty muscle replacement, where literally muscle is being replaced with fat. And so those, those um, adipocytes, those fat cells are different types of fat. And, and, but there's a correlation. So what's interesting is you can be pretty simple about this and say, you know what, all I really have to do is target visceral fat and get rid of it. And I will get rid of my muscle fat and I will get rid of my organ fat, fat around your organ, like surrounding your, uh, your, your heart and then fat deposited within your organs, such as fatty liver disease. And so an interesting uh, example, maybe I'll pull this up to, just so people can, uh, can see it. Let me just pull ahead real fast uh, to this, this image here, um, is to, to show the example of, of this is a scan of obviously somebody with a lot of visceral fat, okay? And the, the other thing is to, to note is they got a lot of uh, white streaks in their, their muscle. If I blow that up, you can see all that, that white in that muscle. That is fatty replacement of muscle tissue, myosteatosis. Well, let's concentrate on this particular area of white here. And this, this area white here is your love handles. So in your back where your love handles are, uh, you can scan through them, and what we find is a lot of fat. They're all fat. And what's interesting is, if I back up out of this way and maybe move the scan up a little bit, can you appreciate there's a black line that's, that's traveling around this area? That black line yeah, see is, is actually called scarpa's fascia. It's a membrane, and it's surrounded by fat on the front and back end of it. Isn't that interesting? Why would nature put a membrane between two bodies of fat that look the same? The reason is they're not the same. It's like bricks and clouds. So while visceral fat secretes inflammatory molecules that destroy tissue, ruin your health, and ruin your appearance, so does this fat right here. This fat here is subcutaneous fat, but it's a type of subcutaneous fat. It's deep subcutaneous fat. And while visceral fat is not taught in medical school, neither is deep subcutaneous fat. I actually studied visceral fat for years, like nine years before I started studying deep subcutaneous fat. It's its wicked twin brother or twin sister or twin cousin, however you want to look at it. The two go hand in hand. So the more visceral fat that you have uh, in your abdomen, the more deep subcutaneous fat you have. It's just like muscle fat. But this stuff here, the subcu superficial subcutaneous fat, it's secretory too, but it doesn't secrete inflammatory molecules. It secretes an awesome beneficial molecule called adiponectin, A D I P O N E C T I N, just like it sounds. Google it, fall in love with it because your doctor doesn't know about it. And you're not going to hear about it for probably quite a while, but you can research it and see all these studies that are out about it and how great it is. Why is it great? because it prevents cardiovascular disease. It's, it's associated with lower, less forms of cancer, less forms of fatty liver disease and organ fat. And so what we find is the more of this uh, superficial uh, subcutaneous fat you have, the less obesity you have, the less disease you have. So that's why I did this you know, video on liposuction is insane. 
because it's getting rid of the type of fat that protects you while ignoring this stuff. And guess what happens when you get rid of it? You accumulate more of this because this stuff, the superficial stuff, helps to keep obesity and visceral fat in check. So it's worth understanding, hopefully your audience, if they, they're benefiting from this podcast, are appreciating, my God, I didn't know there were so many different types of fat. Everybody lumps it together. And mostly, you know, they're kind of vague about fat, you know, you know, uh, and they even might tell you that, you know, uh, you're healthy at any weight and they, they want, want you to even feel good about your fat. No, you, you want to understand your fat. You want to optimize the good one which is superficial subcutaneous fat. That's why Dr. Sean tries to keep a little layer of fat on so I'm not walking around with a six-pack. I got a little layer of fat. I got a nice shape of my abdomen, for sure. You know, I don't got a dad bod, but I keep a little layer of fat protection on my, uh, uh, over my abs. You can, you can see some definition, but I'm not going to win any physique contest. Let me jump in here, Dr. Sean. As you're talking about that, it gets me thinking about, because now we have all these different classes of fats and it's there's only three different ones, so it's not overly complicated. But for somebody who has a lot of subcutaneous fat now, beyond your healthy amount, somebody that has a big belly, and again, to clarify, we're not talking about the visceral fat anymore, because the adiponectin, is that better to actually have more than, say, you have? Yeah, so um, it's the Goldilocks answer. There's probably a certain amount of superficial subcutaneous fat that you want, and in excess of that, it becomes problematic. We don't know what that exact amount is. It should be studied, and we want to we wanna take a look at it. Here's my simple answer, and uh, I, I'd love a, anybody else to, to come up with a different one. You want a little bit so that it looks good, but when it looks like it's too much and you're, you're fat, you've gone too far. So you want to throttle back on your superficial subcutaneous fat so that you reach just this layer of fat that basically looks like, hey, this guy or woman looks like they have a, 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 a basic small amount of reserve and how I, I relate it ancestrally so that it looks like I am good at hunting. I catch enough meat that I have an extra amount of reserve on me and I'm not living on the edge, hunt, you know, one hunt to the next hunt where I have no reserves at all. That's, that's unhealthy. You want to basically have some luxury when it comes to the amount of, of how successful you are at hunting so that it shows up as a little bit of reserve, but not too much. And then this new layer of fat that we just talked about, the deeper part of the love handle, when we get rid of visceral fat, and we're going to get to what people need to do to get rid of that, that'll naturally take care of itself as we get rid of the visceral fat. Yeah. And so let me show you um, a cool um, uh, uh, a series of scans. And, and, le and let me embarrass myself a little bit. I have looked at this scans thousands of times, and this is very interesting. I just saw this in a podcast for like after looking at it for thousands of times, I noticed something really critical that my eyes, as much as I like to pretend and think that I know stuff, I don't. I'm just barely scratching at the surface after studying health optimization for 13 years. I'm still learning. So let me, let me show, let me try to answer that question with this explanation. This scan is a follow-up scan of a CEO of a company. This guy uh, ran a company. This is his follow-up scan about three months after his, his first initial scan. And we gave him strategies. He was part of our uh, subject, a panel of subjects that we're studying for the National Science Foundation. We gave him strategies to do. He came back. And he was supposed to be better. But guess what? He wasn't really any better. And I'm like, either uh, we're wrong about our strategies or you did not do them. And so we went through all the strategies. He claimed he did, was doing them all. So 
the five questions we have for them, which we'll cover right now, the things that cause either visceral fat to stay or get worse and not go away are cheating. So processed carbohydrates, processed foods. That is the biggest contributor, and I'll go back in a scan and show you why very convincingly. Uh, and he assured me, nope, I'm not eating processed carbs. The second was alcohol. Are you drinking? We saw people that consume alcohol based on uh, the amount of alcohol they consume would cause more deposition or more intransigence or made visceral fat refractory to elimination. He assured me he wasn't drinking a drop. The third one we, all, we ask about that we saw causes visceral fat or makes it uh, impossible, hard to eliminate, is poor sleep. If you're not sleeping because you are staying up at night, you're gambling, you're looking at uh, the internet, pornography, whatever. Uh, you you're, you're got insomnia, you got, you got obstructive sleep apnea, or you got an enlarged prostate, and you're waking up five times a night to pee. Whatever interferes with your sleep is going to contribute to visceral fat, either not being able to go away or it'll make it worse. The fourth one is stress. Stress is a killer. It causes visceral fat to accumulate. And a lot of people might be uh, executives or you know high performers or professionals. They might look good, but they got stress and they have visceral fat being deposited in their abdomens, but they're thin. And so we would see that. And this is that it was uh, in a lot of executives like that. And the fifth one is endurance exercise. Too much exercise. When it comes to exercise, there's a Goldilocks principle. If you exercise too much, you're sort of like, uh, you know, uh, slaves, you know, like the uh, from the Old Testament, Egyptian slaves, you know, the Egyptian taskmasters, Pharaoh and, and stuff, working up to death. Well, that's not healthy. You know, there, you, you want a certain amount of exercise and not too much. There's that Goldilocks. So this guy was a distance runner. He was running 10 miles a day, five days a week, and his visceral fat did not get any better. But he was doing all the strategies. So he said, stop it, or we're going to kick you out of the study. No more free MRIs. No more free exams by, you know, physicians. You know, you're out of here. And so he agreed to quit running, and he started sprinting, which is what he was instructed to do in the first place. And in two months, you know, these are the, the dates up here. He goes from here, all this visceral fat, to almost no visceral fat, Jesse. So he has no visceral fat. And look how he build, build up his muscles. I mean, the MRI tech, before he scanned him, said, Sean, when I was helping this guy get in his patient gown, he's got all these muscles now. And so when I scanned him, I'm like, God, you know, that MRI is so dramatically different. I actually had to ask him if he was doing steroids or on testosterone replacement or some other pharmacologic, you know, medication to enhance his his change. I said, please don't corrupt our science. We got we to know this because we're, we're doing work for humanity for the National Science Foundation. So the only difference he did was he started sprinting. So um, to answer your point, you know, sprinting has this really beneficial effect on eliminating visceral fat. And it's really an important um, strategy that we give all our clients now to do maximum intensity exercise because of its, its contribution in burning up visceral fat. So you don't have to exercise a long time. You just have to exercise very intensely for a short period of time infrequently. And how intense? Maximally. Your hardest effort. When you sprint, you know, you're not just running fast. You're running as fast as you possibly can run. And that's what we find, that kind of level engagement of the musculature, your physiology, what you're involved with, burns that visceral fat the best. And obviously, if somebody is coming to this and they're loaded with visceral fat, subcutaneous fat, and they're really out of shape, they need to take their time in building up to that. Yeah, so um, that is a very good point. If you fail to appreciate that, you know, the visceral fat that you've gotten has put you out of shape. If you suddenly decide to sprint, you are so at risk for straining a, a, a hamstring typically. And it always, uh, every, every 
sprinter, everybody has tried to do this so far, and it's got an injury, an injury sprinting. It's always when they accelerate. So they accelerate way too fast. They just imagine themselves, Usain Bolt, they're coming off the starter blocks, and they're just going to crush it. Kevin Hart was recently in the news for doing this. He tore his abdomen. That's what he claimed. I, I suspect that the, the medical term for that is probably he got a hernia, <laughs> but he strained too much, and those muscles are so, and the tissues are so inflamed that they tore. And so you can strain your muscles, tear your muscles, and it can be, I'll go so far as to say it could be permanent. You could permanently damage yourself, but most of the time it's kind of, you know, it's transitory and you get through it. But to return to this subcutaneous fat that you just mentioned your, and, your, and, the, and the visceral fat, look at the, the, the deep subcutaneous fat here, uh, how big it is there, and how, how, how much it's smaller it's gotten. So what nature does when you sprint is gets rid of visceral fat first, deep subcutaneous fat first, and it leaves your, your superficial subcutaneous fat, the good stuff. So when you do the right things, it gets rid of the bad and it, it allows the good tissue, your muscles, your superficial subcutaneous fat that's creating that glorious molecule to stick around. So that's, that's the take home message. Uh, if you're listening today, if you can find out the correct way to exercise, the correct way to live, the correct way to eat, then your body optimizes. And that's why I hope you follow, you know, the Ultimate Health Podcast. You're, you're listening to Jesse to get his content to figure out how, you know, to be ultimately healthy. I mean, it's a, it's an important goal. I mean, I, I think we're almost deserving uh, humanity just simply holding out, getting healthy. I mean, you, I mean, there is such a difference in the degree to which you get healthy that it's, it's almost a fool's errand to represent to somebody, we're going to get you healthy. No, you, you need to start with an awareness that your body is your most important physical asset that you own, that you will ever own, and that nothing influences the quality of life, how much you're going to enjoy or suffer. Every circle of circumstance in the future that you're going to encounter than your body. And so recognizing that your body has more to do with that than anything else, you should be purposing to live your life every single day, all day long, to be optimizing your health so that you have the greatest impact on how much you're going to enjoy your life. And almost nobody does that. And that's why you see the masses, 99.999 being sucked out into the ocean where they're treading water, slowly drowning, accumulating disease, only to end up, if they're not dead right away from a heart attack, end up in diapers, needing perianal care uh, from affliction of chronic disease over a period of time. And those uh, very rare person, the 0.00001% that finds out about this notion of optimizing your health eliminating visceral fat and this type of dangerous fat, those people do something very different. They continue to get better for the rest of their lives. And so far, I've been studying this for 13 years, and I will look at you and say, I have no idea where it stops. For as, for as far as, as we've been studying this, people are continuing to improve. So they become a better version of themselves years down the road than they were when they got started. Dr. Sean, I love that. And I want to come back to the picture of your study participant you had on the board there a second ago. And as you're sharing that story, you emphasize the fact that this person was doing four of the five strategies to eliminate visceral fat. So what pops up into my head as you're sharing that is how specific and detailed do we need to be with addressing all five factors to have an impact? Because Sleep is one of them, and right away, I'm a relatively new parent. I have a, a child who's three and a half and one who's one and a half, and you know, a lot of my nights are disrupted, and it's out of my control in a, in a big way. So for people that have one or two of these variables that they can't control, 
how much hope is there for addressing this? Yeah, boy, what a great question. Another one. So, you know, the better you're at in addressing those things, the healthier you're going to be. So sleep disruption, you know, from a baby is very different than sleep disruption from pornography or gaming online. Why? Let me, let me address it from a biological standpoint. You love that uh, uh, new uh, toddler, whoever's a year and a half old, 18 months, and that three-year-old when they wake you up. And guess what happens? When you're woken up to take care of them, a mother is breastfeeding. Let me tell you why biologically that is not as detrimental, even though their sleep is being disrupted uh, to that mother than if she was getting up to, uh, I don't know, uh, gamble or something, or you were getting up to gamble online or do gaming because of a molecule called oxytocin. So when you get up, it's because you love and you have affection for your children that you get blasted with this oxytocin to protect you from the harmful effect of, of visceral fat being deposited and the impact on your health. So if you're listening today, you have to analyze why is my sleep being disrupted? What is going on? And so what I tell my clients is nature favors the organism that analyzes the best. So what does that mean? The man or woman that analyzes their life and their situation to figure out what is going on in the best way possible has an advantage over the organism that doesn't either, either analyze or analyzes incorrectly. So you got to think about you know, why your sleep being is disrupted as a, as a newborn, as a father with a, new, a relatively newborn baby, you know, a little over a year, um, that that's a very different situation than a dad who's up, uh, gambling online or doing gaming or something like that. So, um, yeah, big, big difference. So to get back to your, your question, do the best you can. You, you, uh, a big one, frankly, is stress. So stress is something that people are, are pretty poor uh, at analyzing. So I'll, I'll pull up a picture uh, of stress so you can see uh, and faces. So um, we, we've done uh, our part to take this, this picture here shows uh, a face. And I don't know how well it's, it's projecting in there. Maybe if I tip my camera down a little bit. Um, but these faces are very different. Uh, from each other because the amount of stress in the life of these people. So maybe if I can pull this one guy's face up up here and uh, is isolate, you can see that face a little bit better now. Those faces are different because stress is different. The time period looks, they're almost like completely different people. The time period between these photographs is just three months. And what happened is this guy in this week, like with the days of this photograph, Two episodes of CPR in his chest because he had full cardiac arrest. Two complete heart attacks. This guy died basically twice and you know, was saved by CPR and, you know, had stents. So he was, he was in a job doing film editing. He hated his job, <laughs> super stressed out. And uh, he left it and look at the impact when he left his job. And what he did was... He went and took a job that was previously his hobby on the side, working with leather, leather craft, and he created costumes for the film industry instead of doing film editing. So now he's doing what he loved, and he was outdoors. You know, he did this craftsmanship. He was fulfilled, and it manifested in his face. So stress, you know, you got to be able to analyze your situation and see where stress is, is causing you uh, is present in your life. And so I liken stress to lions and tigers. I try to give practical example for my clients. So when they show up to me and we're talking about stress, I say, whatever your lions and tigers are, you got to kill them. You got to get rid of them. Well, sometimes you can't get rid of a lion and tiger. It's just a, a, a stressor. So it might be, you know, you're stuck in a job. Uh, you got a you got a very bad report. Something happened, and um, you may not be able to to fix it. You know, uh, it's just so 
uh, sometimes you have to migrate away from those lions and tigers. Get away from them. If you can't kill them, get away from them. So get a new job, um, you know, uh, migrate. But if you can't migrate and you can't kill them, then you got to deal with them. you gotta, you got to respond to them. So let's look to nature. So an example of those lions and tigers, they don't really go after us too much because we're civilized and we're, we live in concrete buildings now. But they go after antelopes. So let's look at what an antelope, how does a, an antelope, which is the natural prey of a lion or tiger, cope with this stressful milling around of these lions and tigers around in the periphery, causing those little antelopes to, to develop cortisol and be stressed out. How does it abate that cortisol? Sprinting. So when those lion and tigers attack and finally go after the herd of antelopes, they're sprinting to get away. And they're actually improved, benefited from the attack. You see, by the body getting that maximum intensity exercise in that sprint, it reduces the cortisol in that, that antelope. And the antelope lowers that cortisol and is made healthier by the attack, you know, even if it's not a direct attack on it, it's still got to sprint, get away. Um, and so even if, if it's the one it's chasing and that antelope gets away, that thing is going to be really benefited. So what does that mean to you if you're listening today? If you're stuck in a job, uh, you, you're, you're stuck with a stressful situation, uh, a bankruptcy, a, a sick child, you got to deal with the stress of that by doing maximum intensity exercise. So I tell my clients, drop and do 25, 50 push-ups, 100 push-ups. You know, do, do 10 pull-ups, one pull-up, you know, one assisted pull-up. Whatever you can do, some maximum intensity exercise, very intense, maximally intense, brief and, in, and, and frequent to uh, abate that cortisol. So that, that's my example for, for the, the stressful response. So what comes to mind as you share that, you're going to have the decrease in stress from sprinting or doing something uh, explosive activity-wise. Is there also a benefit when it comes to visceral fat and the fat that's infiltrating the muscle of the exercise itself, physiology-wise? Yeah, no. Because you mentioned the cortisol stress piece, but... I get to thinking about those muscles and just firing and, and the impact that would ha have with things like myokines and the changes physiology wise in the body that are going to also have benefits. Yeah. So myokines are awesome. They're some of my favorite molecules. Oh, I love them. So they're a messaging molecule. Since you've referenced them, you probably know that they, they provide messaging. So they only, they not only have localized effect on the tissues right around the area where they're coming from. But they also have uh, effect uh, in distant tissues. And so the chief influence that myokines cause in our, within our bodies are they signal our bodies to do some really two really important things, burn fat and to build muscle. But guess what type of fat it's signaling? Burn the bad stuff like fat within the muscle fat within your, your visceral fat and deep subcutaneous fat. So if you want to get rid of those love handles, you want to produce myokines. Another molecule very similar that causes burning of fat and building a muscle is a, is a relatively newly discovered molecule called LACPHE, L-A-C-P-H-E. It's actually a hybrid molecule of lactate and phenylalanine. So those two molecules get per, get hybridized, they get bound together, and that LACFI molecule gets secreted um, by muscles uh, when you're engaged in maximum forms of, of exercise. So uh, there is no, uh, 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 you, you shouldn't be thinking about muscle fat like, it, like it's, a, it's a positive thing, something you want. You should think about it as uh, the desirable state of, of the human is to not have that humanized marbling. And when you live properly, like doing sprinting, uh, eating food in whole form, you will have less or no uh, muscle fat and no visceral fat by doing that. So, uh, but doing the right things helps to get rid of it. Uh, you just want to, the biggest thing I try to work with my clients is to teach them how they should be living. And I, it's not like, hey, you know, this is, this is from science and we got this all figured out these new marks. 
we have been doing this for hundreds of thousands of years ancestrally. And it's basically when we set out to reverse chronic disease, we didn't, we didn't go to the studies. We started basically with uh, the blueprint going on in nature. We saw that nature doesn't have a lot of chronic disease. Animals in the wild don't have it. It's just one species that roams the earth called Homo sapiens that's filled with chronic disease. And so the long and short answer is uh, animals in the wild live better uh, because they do what they should do. They eat what they should eat. They don't eat what they shouldn't. And uh, they exercise in a very different manner than humans. Humans either don't exercise at all or uh, the other extreme where, the, you know, most people hang out, either they're not exercising or they're going to the gym and doing way too much uh, exercise, way too much endurance exercise. And what you want to do is brief, intense, um, infrequent forms of exercise right in the middle. And uh, that's, that's your sweet spot and your Goldilocks. And you want to be eating what you should eat and not eat what you shouldn't. And so when we looked at ancestrally that, uh, there wasn't any processed foods. So we said, let's see what happens to humans when you cut out processed foods. And so this is a good segue to show uh, exactly what happens when you cut out processed foods. Because we have examples of that because we studied it in um, our clients and our patients and our subjects. So here is an MRI study. Feel, see all that red in there? That, that is visceral fat, so we painted it red, and the yellow is the subcutaneous fat. Now, from here to here, the next image is just two weeks later in the 68-year-old guy. Now, right away, Jesse just looked at that and said, ah, there's less red. But isn't that remarkable? In two weeks, he reduced his visceral fat that much. And what's interesting, Jesse, he only did one thing. One thing. Which ties back to my question before, the fact that do we need to address all these in a heavy way to have an impact? And no. right here, we're seeing you don't. Yeah, just one thing will reduce it this much. Now, the more you do it, the more you address those other five things, the better your results. But you can at least start. Uh, I like to tell people that when you pursue health optimization, it's not a light switch. You know, it's not you know, immediately you, you, you just nail it and you become instantly healthy. It's a journey that you march towards for the rest of your life because you drive the benefit all along in that march. As you're heading in the right direction, you're getting constant benefit and improvement. But your first decision is, I want to really become healthy. That's the light switch. It's a decision. And then this, the first thing I get my clients to do is stop what this guy stopped doing, which is he cut out processed carbs, stopped processed foods, and he ate meat and vegetables in whole form. He ate clean, nothing processed. And I get these questions of, well, what do you mean by processed? Well, if you change the form of meat or vegetables, that's processing. So basically a chunk of meat and a chunk of vegetable. Now, I do advocate fermented foods. And they say, well, that's processing. Nope. I'm talking about processing by humans. So if it's processed by nature, like it ferments, muy bueno, you can do that. Fermented foods actually improve the, the quality of that food by introducing microbes. And I don't want to get, get into that just yet because I'll, I'll get sidetracked. <laughs> but suffice it to say, the purpose of this, this series of scans is to show what happens over a period of time you know, when somebody eliminates processed foods, they go from all this visceral fat here and take a see all that red streak. Um, oh boy, it doesn't really show up. So let me move it uh, over there. Do you see that red streak in that muscle? I got to hold uh, that red in that muscle there is that human marbling. And then watch over 35 weeks how, how much that that visceral fat was eliminated, and look at those muscles now. No more human marbling. The, the, that red streak has left. And that guy just cut out processed foods. He didn't exercise one minute. And here's, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll be real. I, everybody has a degree of arrogance. How much do you have? Now, my arrogance was like super mad at this guy because he wouldn't exercise. But... I, we let him early stay in that study because he at least cut out processed foods 
and he was an older guy and we needed older people. So we allowed him to stay in. Am I ever glad? Because now I see I got this series of scans from just one thing, cutting out processed foods. This is what we saw, this huge impact visually by MRI, proven how much this visceral fat was eliminated when this guy cut out processed foods without exercise. So he didn't stop drinking. He didn't work on his stress. He didn't work on his sleep. He didn't uh, uh, do a, any sprinting or anything else. All he did was stop processed foods. So if you're listening today and you're wondering what you can get started doing, what you should first get started doing, cut out processed foods. As I hear this story, I get thinking about genetics because this guy sounds like a superhuman. He's done one thing and it made such a dramatic change, which brings me to genetics in general. How much does it play into visceral fat and eliminating it? Yeah, well, that's a great question too, because you know I get it a lot. And so a lot of people uh, ask the question, what role does genetics have in my health? And the sad thing, and the really concerning thing I often hear is, they look at somebody that's really healthy or has had really good results and they attribute it to their genes. Or they look at somebody who's really unhealthy or they worse yet, they look at themselves as really unhealthy and they say, I just got bad genes. And I will look at you in your eye and I will tell you what a disappointing insight that you're thinking that way. Because what you want to do is understand that it's your lifestyle way more than your genes that influence your overall health. Now, that's not to say that genetics don't have the potential for causing significance, like Down syndrome, the addition of an extra pair, extra chromosome in the 21st you know, pair of chromosomes has a profound effect on the health of that individual. But for the average person, the vast majority of people, what has far greater influence is lifestyle. And what we find are there are signals, switches on your genes to turn them on or turn them off. So you can either get them to express or you can stop the expression based on how you're living. So we call this area of science epigenetics. So instead of just looking at the genetic structures, we look at the triggers that signal those genetics to express whatever uh, they will express or to suppress that expression. So if you're listening today, please, please, please do not attribute your health situation to your genetics. Ask what you can do to, to improve your genetics. Sort of like that, you know, the president, the famous quote by John F. Kennedy, ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. Ask not what your genes are doing for you, but what you can do for your genes. That's, that's why I tell my clients, change your lifestyle, live optimally, and genetics don't have nearly the influence that you think they do. Okay, well, while we're on genetics, one other area I wanna to touch on in that realm, and it comes back to the fact that this is what makes visceral fat, one of the things that makes it so dangerous, the fact that, People can be skinny and they can have a real problem going on inside and not know it, or they can be fat and have a lot of that subcutaneous fat and also have a lot of visceral fat or a lot of subcutaneous fat and not a lot of visceral fat. Yeah. So where genetics ties in, is that genetic space? The people that can be fat and have low visceral fat or how does, how does that work? Lifestyle. So the people that are um, really skinny, tofies, thin, outside, fat, inside, what we find is um, it's lifestyle. Either they get a lot of stress, they're drinking, they get poor sleep, they're gambling, they're staying up at night, um, they, uh, they are eating a lot of processed foods, and, uh, and, or they may not even be eating a lot of processed foods. They're just eating processed foods but not eating healthy. So, you know, uh, they, the fat they store is all stored as visceral fat. It's not being laid down as healthy subcutaneous fat. So they're, they're mostly tofies. An example of that was the very first uh, scan that I did that I pulled up as an example. I forgot to make that point is in this scan here, 
this is a TOFI. And in fact, um, the TOFI is you, my, my, my colleague who taught me about visceral fat. The reason why he didn't exercise and he was filled with all his visceral fat because he ate rice. Chinese American, Dr. Cheng Zheng Zheng. I just call him CJ because Cheng Zheng is a hard one to say when you're an American. <laughs> so CJ was filled because he ate all this, this rice. And, uh, and so it's, it's really lifestyle. Now, you mentioned the person that could be both fat outside and fat inside. Yeah, you can have a lot of subcutaneous fat and a lot of visceral fat. That's kind of a, a middle of the road. But a really interesting one that is kind of controversial, and, and but I, I'm going to, you know, I'll pull up an image. Um, that this, this is a, a person that was on the, um, the cover of, um, of a Sports Illustrated magazine. And, and, and so here's a, a face of a model. She's pretty. She's got an attractive face. And she made it to the cover of Sports Illustrated uh, magazine, and she's, she's got this attractive look to her. So what we notice, and I'll, I'll show you some other pictures, is as you get rid, if you don't have a lot of visceral fat, or more importantly, if you have not had a lot of influence of visceral fat on your face, your face will look better. Better meaning more attractive. Pretty in a woman, handsome in a guy. And so visceral fat degrades either you being pretty or degrades you being handsome over a slow period of time. So let's look at this lady's body. Now, when this came out, lots of people said, you know, um, th that she's healthy. And a lot of people said, no, she's not healthy. And here, here's, here's what I'm going to tell you. Pure speculation. But I'm going to guess she's healthy because she's got a pretty face. and. She has low visceral fat. If we scanned her, pure speculation, because I don't have an MRI, it's going to be she's mostly subcutaneous fat and mostly superficial subcutaneous fat and not a visceral fat. Now, why do I say that? Well, I've had the benefit of scanning 6,000 uh, men and women, and premenopausal women generally have more superficial subcutaneous fat and less visceral fat relative to the male members of their species. They just have this protective benefit that uh, allows them to, to not get as much visceral fat and uh, to get more uh, 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 superficial subcutaneous fat. And so they have a different appearance. And so that, that example uh, is, is a nice one. But let me, let me show you examples of face, uh, another example of a face there. Uh, whoops. Um, in myself. So let's see if that, that shows up. I don't know why if it, if I had to do it to get it a little bit better. Um, I'm sorry. Maybe, maybe I'm going to do this. I take off this. I see this, uh, light for just a second. I see a glare. Okay. That looks better. So yeah, <laughs> I wish I thought of it now I'm dark, but, <laughs> but yeah, everybody knows what I look like already now. So I'll be this, it's like a, Faisai 2000, those little creatures in the bottom there <laughs> say funny things, except I won't have anything funny to say. <laughs> um, so this, this picture is me with visceral fat. This is me age 48. So you see the inflammatory affluence that visceral fat in my life from living basically five decades uh, with visceral fat. And then this is me uh, recently when visceral fat has been eliminated. So Visceral, visceral fat, the, the appearance of your face becomes a proxy for visceral fat, similar to how uh, love handles become a proxy for visceral fat. So anecdotally, I have realized that um, I, can, I can infer, you know, not measure, but infer uh, how much influence of visceral fat somebody's had in their face by looking, uh, looking at their face. And so when I walk around the Mall of America here in Minnesota and I'm walking by thousands of people, I'm doing a visceral fat calculation because I'm like a little supercomputer with that. And that, that, you know, that's what I do. I analyze visceral fat so I can see it in their faces. And then also I've anecdotally thousands of people I've worked with uh, to eliminate their visceral fat and I see how much of a beneficial change it has uh, in their face over a period of time. So uh, we... When clients come to us, we take extensive photographs of their face, of their abdomens, of their, their 
chests and backs and their necks, fingernails and hands. And we're, we're analyzing the impact visually on these external manifestations in the body uh, and correlating to visceral fat. It's a whole new area of, of science that I'm trying to, uh, to develop and birth, really, uh, to look at external biomarkers with the hope that I obviate the need of doing MRI scans because ancestrally, Jesse, we never had MRI scans and we never had blood studies. We just tracked faces and bodies and muscle and fingernails and eyelashes and hair and uh, spider veins and you know arterial pulses. That's what we paid attention to for hundreds of thousands of years. And that's how humans always improved. And ever since these things called lab studies and scientific studies have come out, we started spiraling down. And so the impact of how we look and how we perform, sadly, is deteriorating over a period of time. So my definition of health is how you look and how you perform. And I teach people to assess that through key biological indicators that I do with photographs and you know, also MRI scans, I do. Um, but I compare MRI scans to, to validate that. If I just say, hey, you need to pay attention to your skin and your eyelashes and you know, spider veins, you, people wouldn't listen to me. This guy's a crack. What about my cholesterol? That's what they say. How about my triglycerides? My fasting insulin? My APOB? Look, it's really your skin and your body and your muscle and how you perform. But I help people uh, correlate that with visceral fat, fat around the heart, fat within their muscle. That gets their attention. That's, that starts, it's way more early, upstream. Your APOB, all these other things are way downstream. They're lagging behind. You want to really track what's the, the way upstream, what's much earlier is your visceral fat, your fat in your muscle, your fat around your organs. So I want to come back to our swimsuit model there and pose a question that I asked before, but I want to get clarification. For somebody like her, who, again, you're speculating, they're bigger on the outside and you're assuming because of the way her face looks, she's thinner on the inside. And when we talked about genetics and different fat in different areas, you had said it was lifestyle. So I'm trying to picture what lifestyle would lead somebody to have that type of body where they're bigger on the outside, yet fat in the inside. Yeah, so that's a good Sorry, question. Sorry, thin on the inside. Yeah, so the FODI, fat outside, thin inside. So um, probably the simplest explanation for why they um, are have excessive adiposity or a large, too large of amount of fat on the outside, but they have um, a, a very small amount or no, no visceral fat inside, a FODI, is they, the short answer is that is a woman that's simply eating and not doing a lot of exercise. They are eating in excess of their caloric needs. And so the energy that they consume in the form of uh, food, calories, is being stored, it's in excess of what their physiological uh, requirements are. So it's stored as uh, accumulated fat reserves underneath their skin and subcutaneous. So uh, basically what you wanna do is not eat in excess of your requirements because why, why would nature uh, not want you to do? Why would it be more ideal to eat more aligned with an ideal amount of food. It's because the process, the debt accumulated, the cost of eating that food, digesting that food, and then laying down that fat is not free. It comes at an expense to us, a tax to our body. So what you want to do is eat what you need to eat digest what you need to eat and lay down the appropriate amount so that you're not paying for more than what you need. And so that woman just overpaid uh, in her life 
for what she what she should have is, is paid less and it, she would have gotten a better result. So hopefully that helps explain it. So I think I, I understand. So you're saying it's an energy, a calorie thing, because mm-hmm. obviously one of the five strategies is the processed foods. So you're saying she would be not eating processed foods because that would add visceral fat, but there's probably too many calories being consumed. Yeah. So there, there's a theory and I, I almost don't like, and you know, don't like bringing it up called calories in calories out. SECO is kind of the abbreviated form calories in calories out. Um, a lot of people, uh, I think it's, my take is it is an oversimplification. Now there is, there are all sorts of physicians that are very passionate about this. Um, there's a guy, uh, Dr. Uh, Nadolsky. Um, he's a smart guy. He's a, uh, I think he's a sports medicine doctor, internal Mr. Steven Nadolsky. He's, he's got a lot of followings on uh, Instagram. He's a big Seco guy. So calories in, calories out. So he basically says, doesn't matter what calorie you eat, you can eat crappy food. <clears throat> well, I think the problem that with that is <clears throat> people get themselves into trouble because the nutrient value of those, if you follow Seco and you think, well, I can eat cotton candy all day long, uh, I can eat chocolate eclairs all day long, and you're not eating nu- nutritiously dense uh, meat and uh, other beneficial food, natural food, you're going to miss on those nutrients. And you're going it, it's, and it's also going to be, you know, uh, uh, you know, you know, uh, an expensive process bringing all that in. Can you give the light? Maybe bring the dim up a little bit in between. Yeah. Uh, so we we were talking about oh yeah, calories in, calories out. So the big the big in, interpose between calories in and calories out. Why that fails and why I I say it's the quality of the calorie. You know, it's not the quantity of the calorie. So I I really am. Uh, biased against the seco theory and i'd rather i'd rather you eat a lot of uh better quality calories and be less res- respective of the quantity than respect the quantity poor quality you know between the two factors of quantity and quality i would go with quality and here's why between these two theories microbiome so it's not the what dictates the calories that get that uh, go in is your microbiome. So those microbes in your gut are part of the digestive process and they decide and determine how many calories get absorbed and in and what 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 form you know nutrients are being created and and so it's this I will call it a black box of sorts because we don't really understand uh, all of the nuances and the subtleties, and, I'm, and I'll go so far as to say we probably never will, not in our lifetime, certainly, uh, with the microbiome. And so when you eat certain calories, they determine the microbes inside your gut. So it's the best example of this is why it's important what you choose is if I want to attract those beautiful, fun, cuddly little creatures called koala bears to my backyard... I'm going to plant eucalyptus trees, but they will do butkus for attracting, uh, say, wolves or um, uh, red cardinals, if I like red cardinals. So you have to give, you know, the, you want to ingest the, the kind of food uh, you ingest dictates the kind of species of microbes that you live within yourself. Now, it's kind of getting the cart in front of the horse. You want to eat what's good for you, And when you eat what's good for you, guess what? You get microbes inside of you that are your allies. The simple best example that I come up with for this epidemic of obesity going around the globe is it's an infection. It's an epidemic infection of obesogenic microbes. They're causing obesity in people. And the reason why we are losing the war is we're not treating the infection. The cause of obesity is simply microbes in your gut. And nobody's addressing this. But step number one, when my clients work with me, is the microbiome. 
and I address it. So I like working with people that are very obese, morbidly obese, and getting rid of their problem by addressing their microbiome. And it's also why people have cravings for food, like, and it, it's, it's never for like fat and meat and protein, it's cotton candy, it's muffins, it's pasta, it's beer, it's chips, carbohydrates. Because these particular obesogenic microbes are dependent upon those simple carbohydrates for their, their source of food. It, they're essential for them. Humans don't have, there's no macronutrient essential requirement for carbohydrates. It's fat and protein. It's essential for these species of microbes that need carbohydrates that start residing in your gut, which all leave you and you have no more cravings if you just eat healthy fat and protein and don't eat carbohydrates and then you cheat you chase those bad guys away and keep them away by eating fermented foods kimchi sauerkraut kvass uh, kefir blue cheese yogurt all plain no sugar <laughs> it's remarkable to me people i'm telling them to cut out carbohydrates eat fermented foods don't eat sugars, then they go get blueberry yogurt. <laughs> you gotta eat plain, unsweetened, unflavored kefirs and 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 yogurts and 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 uh, fermented foods. And then they start occupying in your gut. And the other problem is, and this is why Oprah always would gain weight and lose weight, is because nobody addressed her microbiome. She yo-yoed. And if you've yo-yoed on your diet, you have not addressed your microbiome. And once you address your microbiome, you'll start attacking that biofilm of those carbohydrate-loving microorganisms live down there by uh, a strategy of daily consumption of fermented foods. And that's what I get my clients to do. All right, let me recap here with the diet. We've said a lot of different good stuff. So eliminate processed foods. Fermented foods are good carbohydrates, I want to get deeper into this. It sounds like for you, at least you're eliminating them. But if I'm somebody that comes to work with you and I'm eating a standard type diet, what do you recommend with carbs? Yeah. So, um, I, I never want to have anybody think I'm a, 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 a light switch guy, like zero carbs. That's for me. Now for you, you may be able to eat carbohydrates and do perfectly well with it because you have a microbiome that allows you to consume those things and, and be healthy. I had long ago destroyed my microbiome because I was a kid to learn how to make fudge at the age of four with a candy thermometer. My mom should have probably been, you know, taken to criminally charge teaching me how to use, make fudge at the age of four. But that caused me all sorts of problems having a, sh a sugar addiction. And I was making pralines by the time I was 12, candies. I mean, what kind of a childhood is that? So if you can eat fruit, you can eat carbohydrates, and you don't have visceral adiposity, you don't have deposition of visceral fat, you don't have organ fat, you don't have muscle fat, and you can do that for years and years, God bless you. It's not you, it's your microbiome. You've managed to acquire the, the right microbes to allow you to process those, mar those microbes. But you don't know whether you're in that camp unless you get in the scans uh, or unless you have a body of knowledge that you're aware of how visceral fat manifests in the skin, all the biomarkers that I'm accumulating to find out where you may not have to do an MRI scan if you're tracking these other things. But um, I would say to you, if you're somebody that is a carb lover, you better get the scan and better see. And not, it's not just where you are in one point in time. It's where you are over several periods of time. So you want to get a scan a few times and see where that strategy of, of and, you know, the carbohydrates you're eating, um, you can get away with and you're not causing harm um, or whether you need to make an adjustment by cutting back on those carbohydrates or maybe you need to do what I do. And I'll be honest, you know, most of my clients who come to me, uh, they're really in trouble. And so um, I get them to, to go zero carb. Um, first of all, it, no, nobody, nobody has come out and said that carbohydrates, the science is wrong. Uh, yeah, it's a macronutrient. You need it to actually survive. We were wrong about that. Nobody, nobody's come up with a study showing that. So I start with the presumptions, stick with fat and protein down the road. Maybe we can introduce some carbohydrates down the road. And if you come to me and you want to stay with carbs, fine. I work with vegans. I have vegan clients. 
Uh, they're eating a lot of carbohydrates. They're not, they're not eating meat at all. And so I give them strategies at least to track their visceral fat to get rid of that because I actually have 47 strategies that I, I give my clients to work on to optimize their amount of visceral fat and their, their eliminate fat in their muscles. So there's, there's a lot of other things besides diet uh, that go into, um, into that that I work with. But yeah, I, I don't think that everybody has to give up carbohydrates. Uh, my explanation is the difference between people that can eat carbs and those who can't is it's their microbiome. Got it. Talk more about that vegan piece. What does a typical vegan scan look like when somebody comes to see you? And then what's the best you can do? Do you have different goals when they're vegan to get the visceral fat down to a certain level? I'm just picturing, again, a diet so heavy in carbs. And you're talking about the ideal of being no carbs. So talk about where you can take them. Yeah. So with the vegans, um, unfortunately, I mean, I, I wish it was otherwise. Uh, they, they come with elevated amounts of visceral fat, more than the average person. Even, uh, you know, I've had, I, I had this one example of somebody who came to me uh, who's at doctoral level. Okay, I won't give too many details, but they, they basically had earned a doctor. Very smart, very intelligent. And I said, look, I can see you've got visceral fat in your face. I'm going to scan you. And when I scan you, they were in my office you know, where I had a scanner. And I said, I'm going to show you I'll be able to quantify how much visceral fat you have inside of you. And this guy looked at me. I'll never forget it. He looked right at me. He was in his 70s. He goes, oh, well, Dr. O'Mara, I have been vegan for 30 years. You're not going to find any visceral fat inside of me. 10 pounds of visceral fat was revealed inside of him. 30 years vegan. What did he do? He walked out of that office, started eating meat. That's the power of the MRI. And so I have this clever little phrase, the MRI, don't let you lie. It ends the deception that you may be operating under. So get the scan and know for sure what's happening within your diet. Now, I have vegans that have elected to stay vegan, and I get rid of their visceral fat. And, you know, I get them to cut out processed foods. A lot of vegans are eating bread and pasta and, you know, other things, you know, uh, pastries. <laughs> it's crazy. And they think it's okay because there's no animal product. And there's another, I have clients that work with me, help me educate this. There's also whole food plant-based. These are people whose ideology against meat is for health reasons and not philosophically to support animal rights. You know, it's a whole food plant-based is they, these are strategies or people that are identifying their interest in, in how they eat for, for health alignment to avoid meat that they think is inflammatory. So I help people to quantify these biomarkers and to make the choices that align with eliminating this visceral fat. And so, um, I, you know, even though there is a lot of tension, I'll describe between the carnivores and the vegans, and I'm sort of in the middle because I'm this doctor, I self-identify as this meat-loving doctor, and then I eat a garnish of vegetables, but only if they're fermented, and food, fruit, only if it's fermented. So pure carnivores don't think I'm carnivore, vegans don't think I'm vegan, whole food, plant-based, don't think I'm whole food, plant-based because I'm eating meat, but I, I'm right in the middle. And I tell those people, for God's sakes, at least you got to cut out the processed foods. The carnivores, you know, um, for the most part are, are a little bit better to get at those processed foods, but whatever camp you're at, you will have some improvement by cutting out processed foods, you, you'll see that improvement. And then there are, of course, a lot of other things that we've alluded to, the alcohol, the sleep, the stress, uh, the forms of exercise, um, and then, you know, other things like, you know, being outside, nature, sunshine, these other strategies. I get into a lot of things to optimize humans. All right, before we leave the carb piece, just to really hit it home, it sounds like processed foods is your biggest piece of this whole diet. But carbs is like a fast forward button. If you're willing to get rid of the carbs, that will help get rid of the visceral fat quicker. Yeah, I think so. You know, I, uh, I you know, uh, it, it's not like I have something wrong with me that says the, you know, that uh, the carbohydrates didn't me. I know these people, uh, 
dude, I was a carboholic. I know the feeling and the benefit that they, they provided me. Um, but yeah, so down the road, I hold that hope that maybe Sean could get, could return to eating some carbs, maybe some fruit that hasn't been fermented. And maybe, you know, if I could, you know, uh, even be able to eat a piece of fudge, you know, like it, it, that it, that, it, that I could safely consume it because my microbiome protects me. It's that interface because I've acquired the right microbes to reduce that sugar, but not cause the problem of turns, turns of bad adiposity, inflammation, uh, and disease, uh, from the more pathogenic microbes that I think define most of my microbiome in the beginning. So, yeah, I think um, I, I right now take people, put them on the ultimate elimination diet. I get them on carnivore, uh, eating just meat, and then I have them garnish that meat with a little bit of ferments uh, for their microbial benefit, those microbes, not for sustenance or food benefit. You're eating those fermented foods uh, to to act as a garnish to to contribute to the digestive process beginning in the mouth. You know, chewing that meat with fermented foods so that you're interspersing these really great microbes uh, into your digestive system in your mouth instead of the bad guys you got in your mouth right now. You. Most people have very bad pathogenic microbes inside their mouths. And then they're chewing meat or vegetables and putting, you know, those bad microbes and it's swallowing it. And then they're wondering why they may not have a good microbiome. Ooh. You know, it's because how you started it, you know, was wrong. So traditional people, you know, ingest the Koreans. First thing that gets, you know, a big plate, it's empty, six little bowls around the top. And then comes the fermented foods. And then the piece of meat, and you got to eat those together, chewing them together. That's how, uh, you know, cultures of people that have had a very low level of disease for a long period of time um, eat in that particular way. So it's, it's a really great strategy. All right. So it's obvious the importance of the microbiome when it comes to the way you eat. How do you feel about probiotics? You talked about how the microbiome is a black box at this point. And for me, when I think about probiotics, I feel like we're still in the really early stages of figuring out different strains and species and and how those are going to play out in the gut. So how do you feel about those? Yeah. So um, I, I don't use them. I don't take them. And I discourage my clients from taking them. The reason is I think they're shortcuts. Um, I think I think there's a lot of fancy marketing. Uh, the studies that, that support the probiotic use are pretty poor. Uh, and uh, I basically say, you know what? I've never seen a single probiotic supplement that comes as close to just a tablespoon of kimchi or uh, a tablespoon of kvass uh, or kefir. So uh, I tell my clients, save your money. Uh, don't spend money on probiotics. Uh, an interesting kind of intermediary is going to be a fecal microbiota transplant. We're finding out that stool transplants that often that can now be done similar to how a probiotic could be used. You simply swallow uh, a encapsulated uh, form, processed food, processed form of those feces. Um, is going to be far more eff efficacious and beneficial to a human than um, eating some sterilized, uh, pr mass-produced artificial probiotic. Uh, that is in a capsule. So the the easier, more uh, in reach form of an FMT, fecal microbiota transplant, and because there's people right now that are gasping, they're, they're t you know, they're coughing. Uh, they just emptied their stomach a little bit in their mouth of the notion of uh, taking a capsule with feces going down in your mouth. Well, the way it's it's basically done now is it's it's dry, desiccated process, and it and it's not smelly and 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 not like you're imagining. Um, but the, the way I like to do FMTs, right, I tell people is we do them all day long. We're doing FMTs with who we live and who we associate with just by touching them and being in the environment. So when you sit on the couch with another family member, you have done a micro FMT. Like it or not, their fecal microbes are in that couch. 
Um, this is an interesting example. Uh, my 14-year-old son, when he was three or four years old, had such heightened smell. This is the way I've never seen a human being. He could tell if you had had a bowel movement, he could smell it somehow on your hands or lingering on your skin. Uh, if you had that bowel movement 3,000 feet away, if you showed up next to him, he could smell it coming off your body. That's how heightened he was. So, yeah, these microbes linger on us. They're on us, and they, they're, they're trans, transplanted between us when we share workspace, work environments, a park bench with another human being. I mean, this is, this is what's going on. So you want to have the healthiest microbiome because you don't know what you're harvesting. When you sit somewhere, you touch a handrail in a shopping mall, an elevator button in a building. You are harvesting microbes. And so you want the most amount of good ones. So if those bad ones are coming down, they can take care of those bad ones. And if they're good ones coming down and you got good ones in there, they say, hey guys, let's get about the business of taking care of boss man. You know, we want to make this, our hose, the healthiest as possible. So it's really the microbiome is hugely important. All right. So no probiotics for you or your patients. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> what about other supplements? Um, yeah, I have some favorites. Um, magnesium, magnesium glycinate, uh, potassium. I think uh, magnesium is the biggest nutritional deficiency in the United States. It's likely the world. Um, and and you can't just take magnesium. You got to also take potassium with it. So it optimizes and, and helps you to absorb it better. So magnesium, potassium are essentials for me. Um, I'm a big uh, proponent of lithium orotate, lithium and uh, the mineral, not the drug. I think that's uh, marvelously neuroprotective uh, against um, uh, neuronal damage. So I think it's, it's, it's a great, um, great mineral to take. Um, I'm also very fond of NAC, N-acetylcysteine, um, even though it's a, it's a supplement, it, it does have very good results in studies, uh, interesting results to help eliminate adiposity, particularly visceral fat. So I think NAC, it's also interesting to me, Jesse, that big pharma, through its influence on FDA, attacked NAC and tried, and they were banning it for a while. For a while, Amazon wouldn't sell NAC because the FDA came out and said, we're going to ban this stuff. So, <laughs> Sean, I've got jars of NAC up in my closet because I could see they were going to come after that stuff. And if they're coming after a supplement, they're threatened by it. Because big pharma, you know, that stuff is is really good stuff. And I've given grams of it intravenously as a physician to people to protect against um, hepatotoxicity, liver damage, and, and people that get certain toxins, particularly like Tylenol uh, toxicity. So NAC is, NAC is really pretty beneficial stuff. And based on the behavior of how threatened big pharma was with it, um, I, I think it's a good supplement, so I recommend I recommend it to my clients. While we're on the diet piece, supplements, how do you feel about intermittent fasting? Yeah, so fasting um, is awesome. I I I think fasting leads to my superpowers. So, um, you know, we could do we could do probably five straight shows on fasting, but my my response about fasting is it leads to superpowers, and it does so through a very interesting physiological response that your body has to fasting. I think fasting is is uh, most people think of as fasting as a kind of a weight loss strategy, but that that's that's sort of like saying you go to school to learn how to dress cool. <laughs> no, you go to school to become educated. You fast to improve your health. And it's, if you're looking at it just from a weight loss perspective, you're looking at it myopically, short-sightedly. The real focus and the benefit on fasting is through autophagy. And autophagy is the process by which cells repair and clean themselves up, repair damage. And so you, you want to be the healthiest collection of cells you can possibly be by addressing the health of every individual cell. And that happens the best that I can think of as a health optimizing physician through autophagy. 
And so when you fast linearly in a direct relationship, the longer you fast, the more autophagy you get to at least about 72 to maybe 96 hours. That's my Goldilocks recommendation for fasting. And right now, I don't know, I'm not 100% confident, but I do this myself. So, you know, as a health optimized physician trying to nail it, I do that every week. Once a week, three days to four days I fast. And then uh, I do that. So about four times, uh, four times a month, I'm doing that. So almost half the month, uh, I am I am fasting in that in that particular state, and uh, we can measure autophagy um, through a, a a a cell model called uh, chaperone mediated autophagy activity. It's abbreviated CMA activity, and there's an interesting study back in 2021 that looked at stroke patients. And I attended a funeral just a few hours ago for a woman that ultimately died from a stroke, and it was her second one. And if you're a physician, either an ER physician uh, or a neurologist or a, a primary care doctor, you know when you hear stroke, you think of one other thing, the next stroke. It just happens. Why? Because we are bad at managing reversing that disease process. And so you have one stroke, you end up having other strokes. And so this woman had two and ultimately it, it con contributed to her, caused her demise. So uh, what we find in this marker is the people that had the most amount of autophagy never stroked again. And the ones that had the high, the, the, uh, the least amount of autophagy, they always stroked again. And that study should be in every medical practitioner's office, and it, sh it should be in every med school, and everybody listening today should be saying, my God, I want to do autophagy because uh, uh, I'm an ER doctor. Uh, I I've seen all manners of death, gunshots, stabbings, cancer, strokes, bleeds, uh, all different ways, you know, motor vehicle accidents, you could die. And there's only one, the one at the top, if you ask me, the one I do not want to die from is a stroke. I don't want to have a stroke because I don't want to be, I, I, if you haven't figured it out uh, by now, Dr. Sean likes to think about things. I enjoy my brain. I leverage it. And I don't want to be somebody that's laying in a bed, drool coming out of my mouth. And I don't understand uh, uh, my wife when she comes and tells me, I love you, Sean, um, or my children, uh, or I can't say that to other people, or I can't read a study. And so I want to preserve my brain and a stroke steals, steals your brain from you. So I do not want to have a stroke. So I practice fasting. I love autophagy. And when you get into these longer fasts, is there anything you do specifically to increase autophagy like exercise or other? Yeah, man. Yeah. What a great question. That's when I get it on. My longest fast at the end is when I'm doing my biggest workouts. So when I break my fast and I'm feasting, I don't even exercise because that then I want all my blood flow, not going to my muscles, but to my gut to get on the business of digesting that. But when I'm working out, I'm fasting, uh, I'm exercising, my blood is not going to my gut. It's available to go to my muscles, and that's where I crush it. I do my most taxing, most difficult workouts uh, during fasted states. All right. Coming back to the five strategies, we've touched on all of them. I know we only have a few more minutes. We'll end on this. For people that have been hanging on the edge of their seat, they're drinking, say, a glass or two of a wine per week, or it could be any amount of alcohol. Is there a certain amount that isn't damaging when it comes to visceral fat? Um, I won't, I, yeah, I'll have to say that uh, there's no amount that isn't damaging to a certain degree. Uh, there, but here's the question. If I have a client who's coming to me and says, I'm going to drink some alcohol, what's the best form of alcohol? What's the best way I can do this? with the least amount of damage. So here's the answer I get. The least amount of damage, but there's going to be damage, um, is you drink a red Cabernet Sauvignon, a very dry wine, Cabernet Sauvignon, lowest amount of alcohol, uh, probably has um, the most amount of, you know, more, a little bit more benefit, more benefit than other forms of alcohol and less 
uh, less harm to it. So that's the least evil. But, you know, just understand um, alcohol does not improve your life. There is no Olympic athlete that, you know, the best Olympic coaches say, you know, my God, you're not drinking. Let's change that. Start drinking. Nobody's going to do that. It is not going to improve your performance. But if you live a life where, you know, you just decided, you know, it's more more important to you to have a glass of wine with your wife uh, or, you know, to have, you know, a drink with your best friend, uh, then you be optimally healthy. Then I would tell you, have a little red wine um, and I, I would pair it with some steak. They can work well together. Um, and and, and uh, Cabernet Sauvignon is probably the way to go. All right. And last question, caffeine, while we're talking about drinks and controversial ones. Are you somebody that drinks coffee, tea, has caffeine? Cold brew coffee. <laughs> okay, right there. And what about on a regular day versus fasting? Yeah, so um, I do oftentimes drink uh, coffee on a fasting day, uh, but I also do about half my fast uh, with uh, just water, and I won't drink with, uh, with coffee. So I'm ex exploring that. And I find the fast with that coffee more beneficial because they're more taxing. So, you know, um, there's a principle, we never mentioned it, but a lot of my strategies are hormetic in nature, meaning that which does not kill you makes you stronger. So uh, if you, you know, have a, if you can make your fast more tough because you're exercising more, uh, you're, you're, you're creating more demand, uh, you you wear blood flow restriction devices when you're exercised. All these things are, have a hormetic principle. So, um, but yet I still uh, enjoy coffee and I follow the studies. And it looks like it is very beneficial for eliminating atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. About four to five cups a day, um, ideally paired with two to three cups of green tea, uh, with um, you know, without sugar being added to it. And it looks like the polyphenolic compounds are what are causing the benefit. And they appear to be uh, enhanced when they're consumed with protein. So it might mean that you should be consuming your coffee with some protein. Um, my favorite pairing to do with that right now is kefir. So I drink some kefir in advance of my coffee. So when it goes down there, it's, I got some kefir in there uh, to pair with that coffee. And sometimes I drink it with heavy cream, you know, which has protein in it and a lot of fat and less carbohydrates. And so that can be beneficial, I think, sometimes too. But I never pair it uh, with, with, with kefir or any calories when I'm fasting. There are calories about uh, anywhere from 5 to 10 calories in a cup of coffee, uh, but they're, they're minuscule. Uh, you get a pure, better fast if you drink, if you do in a zero calorie fast, but the small little bit, and I liken it this way, Jesse, if we, if we fasted because we couldn't hunt an animal, nobody volitionally fasted a hundred thousand years ago is because we didn't get an animal when we were hunting. Well, we would have drank water in a stream and occasionally we'd have gotten some maybe small microscopic organisms in there. And, uh, maybe we got a few calories in there. So I think it's, it's probably, probably okay. I mean, at least I'm telling myself that five to 10 calories, uh, uh and a cup of coffee on a fast day. Um, uh, I, the pluses minuses, I'm going with the coffee. All right, Dr. Sean, I know I got to let you go. We'll leave it there for now. We'll link up your social media, your website, everything in the show notes. And I hope we can do this again soon. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Jesse, I really enjoyed it. You're a super great host. You had the best questions of any podcast I've ever done. So I'd be welcome to come back and uh, do another show with you. Well, we'll do that. And thank you for the kind words. Really appreciate. Have a great one. Okay. You too, Jesse. Now that you're done my conversation with Dr. Sean, you're going to want to head over here and catch my chat with Dr. Ken. He's got a lot more to share about the carnivore diet. You don't want to miss this. I'll see you over there. I know that you've tried. I know that you've, you've really put in the effort, but you were given the wrong information. If you want good health and, until...